Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being part of our second Travel Zoo web webinar, aptly named Signs of Recovery, but a bumpy road ahead. For today's webinar, I'm pleased to welcome back the legendary Lee Hayhurst uh, from Travel Weekly, who has kindly offered his services again to host the Q&A at the end of our presentation. And um, for those of you who wish to send questions, please use the Q&A button on the screen um, and we will address these at the end of the session. I am also pleased to introduce Martin Alcott, uh, owner and director of Travel Trade Consultancy and friend of Travel Zoo. Martin will be co-presenting with me today and will present a broader view of how the industry is coping and what op opportunities and obstacles still lie ahead. Welcome, Martin. I will kick off and jump straight into our latest survey data. For those of you who were unable to see the first webinar in late March, we took the decision at Travel Zoo to pause our activity, including sending our top 20. After a few weeks, we started surveying our members on a weekly basis and, and have never looked back. Our data is derived from a rolling week send, providing us with a robust number of survey results to compile and then share. In the last few weeks, we have seen some interesting changes to the sentiments of our members, which supports the notion that recovery has not only started, but in fact, there are opportunities for even growth in this market. So let's take a look. An important set of questions that we continue to ask our members are based around travel. Firstly, what is their interest in receiving travel content and how likely are they to book travel right now? I'm thrilled to say that our members are still very much interested in receiving this content and that has increased to 89% of those surveyed, seeing a travel content up from 81%. Whilst a substantial 93% would consider booking a flexible or refundable travel deal, a number that has stayed consistent across the surveys, showing this unwillingness to give up on travelling, a sentiment that I can even personally agree to. Next, we'll take a look at the UK break. It is clear from our data that the UK break continues to grow in popularity, with 83% of our respondents considering going on a UK break this year. As we look into when our members would like to take this break, September followed by July and August remain the most popular periods. With September remaining the most consistent and constant travel month in popularity since the start of COVID. On the next slide, we have a case study from just last week that I wish to share with you all. This deal for a fairy tale Welsh, Welsh chateau that delivered over 850 room nights in just five days, with 60% of those bookings opting to upgrade as well. So why did this product perform? <clears throat> well, if we look at this scenario, it was a combination of factors. This was our first Welsh hotel offer since pre-lockdown, and we knew it was high on the members wish list of destinations. The last time we featured this property was nearly two years ago and was previously run at £149 for just one night. This time it's two nights for basically the same price. It is a seafront property with good summer availability and the deal offers flexibility and refundability to our members. It is this peace of mind that reduces the risk so commonly associated with booking breaks. It is examples like this that has led our hotels sales being up by 83% year over year for the month of May, whilst in COVID. At Travel Zoo, we have a remarkable ability to stimulate demand, even in a cautious and money conscious market. And I think this proves a great example on how we can break the, the market at the moment with these types of deals. This also leads us into where do our members wish to travel to? And on the right hand side, you will see the top UK destinations which our members wish to travel to. Cornwall, Scotland and Devon remain the most popular. In fact, I would raise a rally to any of the hotels on that, this list and in particular hotels in Scotland that wish to work with us. Now's the time as our members are ready and waiting. 
London is also another surprise that we have seen across our last few surveys. What's interesting about London is that whilst it is a city and a lot of people must be thinking about escaping the city, the popularity and prices that clearly are available for London creates that demand and it has remained in the top 10 since the start of our surveys. Moving on to our next slide. We are able to see when our members most wish to travel and what months in particular are the opportunities for our advertising partners. In last week's survey, we saw continued increase in September, with most other months remaining the same. Over half of our audience still see a holiday this year as a goal, whilst 2021 still offers comfort to those members which are looking further out, potentially beyond a COVID scenario. On our next slide, I wanted to share something exciting. I wanted to share a global milestone our best ever performing deal. This incredible offer generated a jaw dropping 4,326 bookings in just five days. That's a booking every two minutes. Meanwhile, every other booking purchased was for an upgrade option to the water villa for twice the price. This deal in five days has gone on to achieve over $4 million in sales. It's simply wow. Now, as much as I would like to take uh, the credit for this deal, it was actually sourced outside our market, um, but it has the same important USPs of the Welsh offer. It has an incredible wow factor, even more than Wales. Sorry to any Welsh people, Martin. Um, it has incredible price point. The travel window was not just for this year, but for two and a half years. Yes a two and a half year travel window. Finally, the icing on the cake was that TravelZoo offers the flexibility with a full refund should the member change their mind at any point. So the question isn't why should you book this deal, it's why wouldn't you book this offer? Truly wow. And so are so many of the destinations on our members wish list. On the right hand side, you will see the top 10 destinations that our members have been surveyed um, have responded to in the survey. Greece perching proudly at the top, while Spain and Italy continue to grow in popularity. These destinations have remained fairly similar over the past four weeks, but Portugal has continued to grow in recent weeks and may be one to watch in future surveys. Now on to cruise. And I am pleased to say that 30% of our audience remain keen to book cruise, with now 62% preferring to travel in 2021. The top cruise routes are the Mediterranean, uh, the Caribbean, river cruise, um, and the fjords and scandics. Ironically, river cruise has certainly been the most underserved from a deal perspective in recent weeks, an opportunity for some of our partners. On the left hand side, you will see a fjord deal that was recently featured by one of our partners, Igloo Cruise. What is so rewarding to see from this case study is the feedback from Igloo and in particular how there are only marginal differences between this year and last year's performance. Whilst we looked at cruise in more depth on the first webinar, what I'm pleased to see demonstrated since then is the continued resilience of this market. In particular, in the early stages of the pandemic, the cruise market was given a particularly bad time in the press. In fact, many articles even quoted the end of cruise as we know it. However, it is case studies like this and others that we have sh uh, been shared that illustrates that our members remain very open to booking cruise as their, as their next holiday. On our final slide, we will look at the duration of stays that our members wish to book. This provides the clearest indication yet that the UK staycation is becoming a favourable choice for this year's holiday. With the longer durations growing in popularity, our members historically have booked one to two night breaks with TravelZoo. As you will see, the most sought after duration is now three to four nights, with a marginal difference between five and seven and the usual short stay, one to two. Looking at holidays, 
The longer duration also seems to be fighting back with more members opting for an eight to 14 night duration over the typical seven night stay. Another opportunity for our partners listening in. So many deals lead in with the shorter stays, yet nearly half our audience act, um, act, who were surveyed actually look for a longer break. In summary, our members remain active in seeking and booking travel content. We have heard examples from travel, cruise and hotel deals where bookings have exceeded expectations and in May alone, Travelzoo delivered a year over year growth of 83% in hotel sales. The flexibility of booking any travel deal in this market is fundamental. Too many individuals have been caught up in a money merry-go-round. This flexibility is key in improving the consumer confidence. UK stays continue to deliver impressive results. The wow factor is still required and members will remain value driven, but the opportunity is huge. We've seen examples shown in, partic in particular with the amazing Maldives offer that our members both locally and globally remain receptive to wow offers. Deals that captivate everyone and with this added flexibility, it will remove the uncertainty holding someone back from booking. Finally, Cruise continues to buck trends and those early critics of Cruise in a COVID world, early signs show that there is a lot more resilience and loyalty in a Cruise customer than what people originally imagined. Thank you all for my time. I will now pass you over to Martin for the next part of this question before the Q&A with Lee. Thank you. Thanks, James. Morning, everyone. So look, for my presentation, I was just gonna dig into a, a bit more of the wider context and, and some of the trends that we seem to be seeing. I think, you know, we've been talking about being in this crisis for getting on for 12 weeks now. And, and until this, for me, crisis always meant something urgent, a rapidly developing situation, things that needed to be done instantly. You know, it was life or death situations uh, arising. But actually, this crisis reminds me more of this uh, scene from Austin Powers. You know, we've seen it coming for 12 weeks. There's very little that lots of businesses can do to to avoid it. And, you know, it's we're sort of frozen and, and you can sort of see this happening. But in day to day terms, nothing really is changing. We're still talking about many of the same issues we have been been throughout. On this next slide, we've um, set out some of the, I suppose, the hurdles that we need to get over, travel businesses need to get over to be able to start traveling again and to be able to start um, selling holidays again. And I think those hurdles fall into a number of categories and there's a lot of them are, are interdependent. Um, the, uh, the, the first one right up front there is the advice from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And You'll see that um, on this next slide coming up, the, the FCO advice and the notes that was put out by the FCO is, is, is pretty clear around the reasons why that, that advice was listed. Now, I, I haven't got any insights on, on, on when they might change that advice, but there were certainly two key things that the Foreign Commonwealth Office were, were, were concerned about and drew attention to. One was countries closing their borders, and, and, and the second was airlines beginning to reduce schedules. Well, in recent weeks, we've really started to see that accelerating. We've started to see countries talking about air bridges and um, bilateral arrangements. We've started to read about, you know, more of a consensus around things when things might open up. And we're also starting to see regularly airlines talking about how they're going to start to um, bring their schedules back. EasyJet, for example, are talking about flying, you know, substantial parts of their route network um, as early as July and August, obviously on dramatically reduced capacity. So the conditions are right. And I think, you know, actually, since I put this slide together just a few days ago, that, that Foreign Commonwealth Office wording, the advice still remains the same, but the wording has definitely changed. And there's a phrase in there to the effect that um, it's being constantly monitored and is constantly under review. So it feels like we're getting close to that FCO advice being lifted or, 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 or relaxed in some way. And that really will be a catalyst, I think, for lots of those other hurdles to start to fall in, into place. Um, on this next slide, though, and I think really just echoing some of the points that James just made, we're definitely starting to see those very early signs of, uh, of confidence returning. So this is a, this, this first slide is a, is a website heat map showing 
for airlines, cruise lines, um, travel companies and, and hotel groups, the, the sort of volumes of, of searching that they've been seeing. And this is being tracked week by week. And I, I think those two parts circled. I think it would be a bit rich to say there's a dramatic improvement there. But at the very least, you could start to say that things are plateauing and, and you're starting to see things either improving or, or at the very least stopping getting worse. And I think that's um, you know a, a, a positive situation. On this next slide, similar story with, with airlines. This is some IATA data just, just from a week or so ago, which seems to suggest that based on global airline volumes and, and, and global airline um, flight sales, that, that that point in April was probably the, the nadir of this crisis. And since then, things have started to improve. So again, slow steps. But I think when you start to add that other data that, that uh, James just just provided and shared, I think you can start to see that there's definitely this slow improvement starting. So I think what trying to piece together what it all means for this recovery and how the recovery will, will play out, I think is, is, is still a challenge. I, I think on this next slide, you can see this is based on just anecdotal conversations with, with our clients. There's definitely going to be this uneven distribution of this recovery. And I think that, that unevenness falls into a number of different areas, but one is it is inevitably the international travel versus domestic travel. Again, some of James's data backs this up and, and, and intuitively it, it makes sense that people will kind of slowly venture out of their homes and will be most comfortable traveling to places that are more familiar and, and a bit easier to, to, to get back from if, if something goes wrong. And I think, you know, we're already starting to see that big uptick in things like um, domestic bookings, talk to some of our clients in the, that sort of domestic vacation rental space, and they're saying that actually occupancy levels for July and August, late July and, and throughout August are, are actually already quite strong. And it, it, it's getting to the point where it's quite hard to, to, to find the, the product that you want if you're a consumer. And that will kind of drive a, a bit of competitive tension and, and, and hopefully will, will increase sales even further. Um, international is, is, is much more slow. And, and that dotted line there is really just based on what our clients are telling us they think will happen. Again, nobody really knows, but it feels like a much slower recovery. But I think on, on, on this next slide, just some of the other areas that I, I think are the other trends that we see coming out of that recovery, which I think are, are, are worth being aware of. And, and some of this comes from a fairly detailed McKinsey study of, of the resurgence of, of the Chinese tourists. Now, there's a million differences between a typical UK tourist and a Chinese tourist to start with. So I don't think you can you can um, rely on this too much. But some of the trends that they observed, you, you know, obviously much later decision making. So people booking much closer to departure. And that has ramifications for businesses who aren't geared up for that ultra late ability to, to, to sell those sorts of holidays. They observed much smaller groups. So whereas people maybe would have traveled in, in larger groups and with family and extended family that had, that had been dramatically cut down to traveling in very small groups or with you know significant other or even solo travel. Um, the, the, the people who were willing to travel were by and large much younger, much more adventurous, generally had been much less affected by, by the, um, the, 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 the virus. But, but equally, you know, and I think definitely this is a dynamic in the UK. It's, it's the older people who are the ones with all of the money and they're the ones that typically buy the more expensive holidays. And if, if, you, if you're then only focusing on a much younger younger traveler, it maybe changes the, the, the nature of the products that, that you're going to be able to sell. But certain, certainly a trend there. And then I think destination wise, and again, some of this has been touched on, the sort of destinations that James mentioned, they, they tend to be a bit more rural. The, the, that London example obviously put the trend a bit, but people are looking for something that is a bit more spaced out, a little bit less congested for obvious reasons. Um, but so I think I think there's definitely you're starting to see that appetite. As I say, international travel I do think um, it is going to be later. And and what some of our clients are telling us on the tour operating side is that they are already really committing. That they've more or less written off up to the end of quarter three. So they're looking for to try to incentivize customers to book for quarter four or really into 2021. And I think on this next slide, I think what's really important is that. That has a real impact, I think, more on the agents and agents' cash flow than it does on tour operators. Just explain this in, in a bit more detail because there's, there's quite a bit going on. But it, 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 essentially, when a travel agent takes a booking, they collect a deposit, but they pay all of that deposit straight out to the tour operator. And often when that deposit is being paid on a credit card, then the travel agent is carrying the cost of that 
that credit card fee, they've paid that out all the way up until they finally collect the final balance. And it's only at that point when they physically collect their commission. So they might be recognizing it from a accounting point of view on the day they make the booking, but they only actually get the cash in their pocket on, on that point of um, collecting final balance. And so whilst the tour operators are typically, uh, certainly the, the, the ones that we're working with are, are a bit more comfortable to say, let's prepare everything for 2021 departures. That has a significant impact on the cash flow of the travel agent who now is is having to more or less trade through the rest of um, this current year without any cash coming in and, and really only will collect that commission on the sort of 10 to 12 weeks prior to departure. So I, th- I think that that does have major ramifications for the agent sector, if, if that is the case, and, and tour operators who are getting some of that deposit money in may be able to live on that cash flow, but clearly agents w- w- would struggle a bit more. On the next slide, just wanted to dig into a few more of the kind of stakeholder hurdles that, that, that I think could upset the recovery. I think, you know, w- w- what we're really turning our attention to is that conceivably you could have, even as soon as the middle of July, a, a, a return of, of customer appetite. You could have a queue of customers out of the door. You could have airlines open and countries open, but you could have one of these other stakeholders that comes from left field and, pre- and, and prevents you from taking advantage of that. And I think that's what everybody has to be really careful of. So obviously that, that includes the regulators. It includes merchant acquirers and lenders and insurers. And I think all of those different stakeholders have a, a, a vested interest in the health of the business and how the, how a travel business has weathered this storm. And a lot of that comes down to exposure. So on this next slide, all of those stakeholders are, are interested in what their exposure is. And I think on, on a normal on a normal year, a, a summer operator's exposure might look like that orange line there where they've around about now collected all of their final balances for summer departures. Those holidays will take place between now and September, and then there'll be a big drop in exposure really until things start to pick up in the January booking season. And that window of opportunity is really important because those stakeholders can have the confidence that they've got an opportunity, maybe it's a month, maybe it's two or three months, where they can make a decision, they can either refuse to renew a facility, they can can take a decision to take away uh, their, their, their particular product without crystallizing a big loss on themselves. And so that's often what gives them that comfort to either give a license in the first place or to um, you know, write an insurance bond or whatever. The, the problem I think they all have at the moment is that the exposure profile is completely out of the window because the normal booking patterns are completely out of the window. So that dotted line maybe looks like that because for example, operators have collected all of the summer final balances, but they've issued refund credit notes and those holidays are now going to take place in, in, in 2021. So the, so the exposure of the regulator or the exposure of the credit card company is now at that high level for the entire period until that holiday is taken. Similarly, we're seeing lots of operators who are turning their attention to domestic products. So um, Abercrombie and Kent released a, um, um, some, some domestic product as did Kuoni. You know, again, that that will upset the normal patterns and booking flows. And so maybe summer operators who wouldn't normally sell much in the way of winter holidays are now looking at winter family holidays to try to you know, get some get some extra cash in and, and, and bolster that recovery. Well, again, that's going to completely upset that normal exposure curve. And I think that's what, that's what we're really seeing at the moment is a nervousness around those stakeholders. We're seeing credit card companies asking for security. We're seeing, um, you know, the, the, the um, whether it be the, the regulator or insurer looking for additional comfort and additional information to really try to get to grips with what, what their potential exposure is. So on this next slide, I think, you know, to, to emphasize the point, I think great that there's some early signs of recovery, but there really is a bumpy road ahead. Just a, a few dates um, worth flagging in particular. So throughout this summer, I think for asshole holders, it's going to be really challenging period. So that's either because they're heading for a September renewal or actually because they renewed their license in in April, the March renewals extended to the end of April. All of those lot or all of the large Apple holders who renewed in April were given a, a restriction on their license basically to say that they had to convince the CAA they they had adequate levels of liquidity and strong enough finances before that restriction would be released. And so that has to happen over the summer. All, all large asshole holders that renewed in April will be trying to have that dialogue with the CAA. 
and, and conceivably you could end up in a situation where you don't have the license capacity to sell the holidays, even though the demand is there for it, which I think would be you know a real a real shame. Um, in August, we've got the start of this furlough scheme tapering down, and, and that's been a, a real benefit for lots of travel companies. Many of them have, have taken advantage, and not just in travel, you know, something like a one study I read, a, a, roughly a quarter of the, the, the UK's workforce were under this scheme at, at one point or other. And I think as that tapers down and operators have to, to, to take on more costs, that's when we'll start to see more in the way of distress and potentially more in the way of, uh, of unfortunately, um, redundancies and, and that sort of thing. Um, September 2020, you mentioned we've got ABSA and ASOL renewals, and, and almost as important is the bonding that underpins those. So we've had real issues in the insurance bonding market, very severely reduced capacity. And it, between now and September, operators renewing at that point have to both convince the regulator and con convince their insurer that they're a, they're a good bet for an another year. Um, and, and we could really see some issues there. I think when you get to um, September and October, really, that's the first time when companies who hold IRTAs will be submitting their accounts. You have a six month window to, to submit them. And those accounts, so that's March and April year ends, will be the very first companies who are showing an impact, I think, of, of, the, of, the, of the coronavirus crisis and could well find that they fall foul of IRTA rules as a result. Now, we do know IRTA have picked off a process of starting to look at what, if any, concessions they will give, and that maybe will result in a, in a tweak to their financial criteria. But inevitably, um, that, that plays to this whole idea of there being potential potholes in the road at any point. That could be because of a security demand from a, from a, a regulator or a, a, um, um, some sort of other stakeholder. It could be because a supplier has failed in your supply chain and that's cost you a, a, a bit of money that you suddenly have even more pressure on your cash flow. And I guess there's always that ever present threat of the second wave and some additional lockdown requirements. And I think I'm probably at risk of uh, depressing everybody a bit too much for 9, 9.30 on a Thursday morning to mention Brexit and the Brexit elephant that will keep running out in front of the road um, throughout this period leading up to the end of December. I think we're all kind of still in the dark about what will happen after this transition arrangement. Um, but inevitably, as has happened ever since the referendum, travel businesses will bear um, the, the brunt of that because of things like foreign currency exposure and, and, and because of things like, um, you know, question marks over the ability to, uh, you know, travel cross border and that sort of thing. So just on to the final slide, I suppose um, it's still, I think, a bit early to say everything is amazing and everything's approving. It's a, certainly we're not saying that, but I think what it does feel, and I think all the data I'm seeing does point to is that We've at least reached the end of the beginning. We're maybe not quite at the beginning of the end yet, but we're certainly nowhere near normal. But reaching the end of the beginning is a really important milestone on this um, on this journey. And, and and I think we always knew we had to at least reach that point when things would stop getting worse before we started to get better. So I think that's for me, you know, as, as positive as we can get at the moment. And I think we just have to to, to, to keep um, pressure on both the, the politicians from the angle of uh, you know, quarantine and FCO advice, and we have to keep doing what we do in terms of um, getting customers comfortable. Uh, and gradually, we'll start to see those early signs of improvement, and you know, the trickle of early improvement into a, a much greater flow of bookings. I think that's all I was going to cover, but I'm around for questions. I'm very happy to talk through uh, any of these things. Back to you, James. Thank you, Martin. Um, Lee. I'd like to introduce Lee Hayhurst. Here he is, Travel Weekly, the legend, as I refer you to, Lee. Yeah, don't, yeah, don't overdo it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks, James, and thanks, Martin. Um, actually, just a quick one for Martin to kick, kick off. So, so anyone who wants to ask a question, you can do by using the Q&A feature. I will see it. It comes up. We've got a couple I'll go through um, as we go through the next half an hour or so. But what, just thing, uh, something that just occurred to me, while, Martin, while you were talking about there, you mentioned refund credit notes and how um, they are accruing a kind of uh, liability that's for agents to take them you know, through a longer period. We're still waiting for absolute clarification that these refund credit notes are being um, supported by Atoll in terms of if there is a failure. We all assume that's the case, but the government isn't able to actually confirm that once and for all. They've hinted at it. 
Um, will that make a difference in terms of how those credit card companies look at the liability then? If Atoll was to say, yes, absolutely, we stand behind the refund credit notes, um, that would help on the credit card side of things. Well, I, I think clarity would help us all, but you, yeah, you're absolutely right, Lee. It's, um, it, it's, I think everybody assumes that the, 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 the Air Travel Trust payment policy is very clear on this point that, that they would be protected, but without that um, unequivocal confirmation from the government, I think it's, it, it puts everybody in a bit of an awkward position. I, I think you know we're already seeing our clients are being asked for lots of information from all sides, whether that be um, insurers, credit card companies, regulators, they're all wanting to know what potential risk is uh, and go to that point of what is their exposure. And for as long as there's a a question mark and we saw this throughout the flight plus years where there was a big debate over what was covered and, and what was not leading up to that regulatory change that was a big concern of the of the merchant acquirers was exactly what would happen in a, in a failure scenario what would we end up with and of course they have a uh, they are they are the legal backstop when customers are paid by card and so if they fear that they're going to end up wearing the liability then then inevitably they will they will take steps to to, to prevent that by you know taking security and that sort of thing so yeah. the, 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 the lack of confirmation just doesn't help anyone. Yeah, do you, do, you've got a bit of insight into this, I'm sure. What, what, what do you think is going on about that lack of clarity? It's, from what we understand, it's, it's, a, it's a, a different opinion between the biz, which is the business, um, business um, division in, in government and Department of Transport, the CAA, and, and it's biz that's been a blocker here because they fear the consumer backlash if if they do confirm credit notes are yeah that, that that's my understanding too it's a, it's a very emotive subject isn't it uh you, you only have to look at it any of the travel press that mentions a story on this and uh you know the the, the number of comments kind of going both ways it, it, it quickly escalates i think it's an awkward position for a government department for one government department to come out and say you know, here's the hole in the fence kind of thing. Here, here's how you, you get around your legal obligation. Because it is a very, very clear legal obligation to refund in 14 days. And I think yeah. probably that that is one reason. I think the other reason is, you know, the Air Travel Trust is in great shape after the Thomas Cook failure. And I think um, the, the CAA were hopeful of renewing guarantees that sat behind that in order to be able to say, yes, we definitely have the, you know, the, the, the sort of the resources to, to cover all of this. So I think there's a few kind of political things at play, but essentially you're right it's departments of business who are um who are prevaricating on it i think yeah and just before we bring james back in on on prospects for the summer um you mentioned diarta's role in all this and it, they're playing an, they play an interesting interesting role i mean i was talking to the chief, chief executive of last minute yesterday and he was saying um you know although iarta has for a number of years tried to bring the kind of airline side of it and the retailer side of it together and work more collaboratively as soon as this crisis happened, they were very much back in the airlines. And even though many airlines, you mentioned that many on in Europe in particular, actually the BA and EasyJet UK airlines are quite good at refunding. And even the American airlines have been fairly good, but it's the big guys on the continent. And IATA is just, even though they know they're not refunding, or they are in a way that makes it virtually impossible to refund, um, publicly they're saying they're refunding. And um, so I wonder if, you know, we, people outside the aviation industry who rely on the aviation industry can expect groups like IATA to you know see the overall picture and not just things from the perspective of their particular members yeah well I you know I, I would say it, it and it's an, it's an important to, to remember that IATA was set up by airlines to look after the interests of airlines it's an it's an airline membership organization really yeah. first and foremost and so it is very self-serving for, for obvious reasons um and i think you know dare i say it, we are starting to see that they, they have they have launched a process to start looking at what what um concessions they will give to agents for example on that on that um whether it's submitting things in, in accounts in time whether it's meeting financial criteria but early indications suggest that again, it's been completely looked at from the perspective of what is best for airlines. And, and if anything, yeah. the early drafts I've seen seem to suggest it's going to be um, tighter financial criteria rather than looser. But um, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. But, uh, you know, I, th I think at the end of the day, that is their role in life is to lobby on behalf of airlines um, yeah. and, 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 and 
therefore, I think as a result, they are a bit kind of one, you know, a bit blinkered, really, a bit one-eyed, and, and and they will fight for airlines' ability to hold on to cash. But equally, they'll, they'll be, you know, the first to take action if an agent doesn't pay on time. Yeah. Do you, do you think this crisis has exposed how airlines operate, and there may well be some changes on that front with regulators in Europe? Yeah. This this whole point around where the cash sits and 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 who's holding it and and how early, I, I think there's um. It, it, it has kind of lifted the lid on um, what, and not just airlines. In fairness, I think everyone along the supply chain. Yeah. I think when when cash is suddenly constrained, everybody is looking at how, how do I cover my position. And and so you, you do hear a lot of talk about trust accounts, for example, and that that's one kind of clear way that it, it, a, a bit more discipline could be brought to this because you know cash being sat at every part of the supply chain inevitably there's pressure but you know airlines look at the very capital intensive businesses they have got a much bigger uh, and a much more fixed much higher fixed cost base than everybody else in the supply chain and for obvious reasons they need the, the money up front i think that's the problem i've found with this uh, and maybe i'm sort of too kind of diplomatic for my own good but i think wherever you sit on the supply chain you can empathize with why people have taken the actions they've taken mm-hmm. it's just um you know everybody is is everybody is now kind of um, at loggerheads with everybody else in that chain and you know you're hearing operators refusing to or agents refusing to work with certain operators anymore and operators yeah. saying they won't work with certain airlines it is a real tragedy mm. yeah let's uh, let's go back to, to, to James I mean um, so uh, there's you, you sense I mean it's been remarkable and every day you sense sort of increasing amount of it um, optimism returning and it's almost it's almost hourly you know as soon as someone says something on the tv boris might say something about cruise yesterday you know um it, it, it seems to be happening quite quickly and yet there's still huge challenges for this summer in particular and uh, you know it's only a few weeks ago most people we were speaking to were just saying look this summer's finished we're not gonna we're not gonna consider this summer at all really um you know, we, we've just got to look further beyond that your your, your data suggests the for the consumer, they've not moved off this summer, but but um, you know, is is there an air of caution about what this summer can really bring? And I think you said over half of your membership would go somewhere, would travel this summer, which yeah. is positive. Yeah. But but is it is there a danger that people get a little bit too excited that things are going to suddenly come back? Yes, I, 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 using one of Martin's analogies when we spoke about Brexit, which was the, the ketchup bottle, it's kind of like that again. We've got this very pent up um, kind of sentiment among members who are just waiting each week, as you said, for something from the government to say, can I, can I book this holiday? And that's the same for a UK break. Um, or a foreign break. So, uh, you know, if if the UK government announced next week that there was an air bridge between here and one country, say France, we, we, we all know that we would see a surge in bookings for France because there are people who are just desperate to get out of the UK um, and, and do that travel. Um, from a UK perspective, um, obviously the government made uh, put a, a basic stake in the ground and said that from the 4th of July, they do envisage some form of UK accommodation opening up they haven't given more details around that um, and I imagine you know uh, the the article that was linked in the BBC only the, earlier this week highlighted that the plan would be to hopefully work with those properties that are self catering that are lodges um, that are rental properties they would probably be the starting place um, for, for the easing and I I think what we'll see as this goes on is that pent up is going to build up further and further and if we are are going to see a relaxation in the rules around the UK then there'll be an increase in UK sales because we've seen that build each week and I think it will continue to build. The only change will be is if something short term changes around our flying. Um, obviously airlines are saying well we're going to start flying now um, but there's the 14 day quarantine in return so we uh, it's going to be a bit of a wait and see but from our perspective we are very confident around the UK market we're very confident about 2021 bookings for travel the the question mark is going to be about international travel this summer and is that going to happen I agree with you weeks ago most people were saying that's not going to happen Um, but the government is under an increasing amount of pressure and Boris Johnson has very very subtly mentioned a few times that this is going to be reviewed the guidance has now changed online as martin um, highlighted so the signs are that something is going to happen maybe before the end of the summer yeah yeah and it's interesting i think you in your list of 
countries of popularity and um, your popularity list, Portugal had, done, had had a bit of a leap. Why is that? It's because people are talking about well, Portugal has been very out, out there and saying we're open for business and, and they've specifically said we'd be happy to have Brits, you know, I think yes. pending, pending some safety and fears about us bringing the, the virus to them. So you, that that is having an impact every time something is said around an air bridge or the possibility of going, isn't it? Yes, definitely. And we saw the same reaction with France. Um, you know, earlier on in the trend, France became, I think, our second largest, um, you know, destination, wish destination by our members. But it was coincided with uh, information around France being one of the countries that the UK would be able to travel to and from without quarantine. Um, the government then changed that. Um, a bit of guidance and France moved slowly back down the, the top 10. It still remains as a popular destination, I think in particular because people probably still envisage it as a an, a country that they can drive to in, in, a, in a form of kind of isolated way. They can they can take a car ferry over, they can do the Channel Tunnel, um, they could do a rental property over there. So France offers probably um, a lot more, should we say, um, opportunities to do, to remain in that kind of COVID isolation yeah. uh, mentality than, than other destinations where you do have to jump on a plane and you go into a large hotel where there could be four or five hundred people. Yeah, it was interesting the other day, I think Cy Cyprus announced that um, they were going to um, uh, uh, pay for anyone, anyone who went there and caught COVID, they would pay for the hospital um, treatment or and or hotel, extra hotel stays while they were there, which was a really savvy move, I thought, because it is about reassurance, isn't it? About making people think, well, if I go somewhere, can I get back? And of course, for Cyprus, I think their biggest markets are the UK and Russia, both of which are the hardest hit with COVID at the minute. Yes, so I guess yes. you might see some more of that, where the destinations, when they know it's safe or they feel it's safe, might mm. be offer further reassurance for people to, to travel. Yes, and I, I think what you'll also see is you're going to see more PR and media coming from those markets that necessarily the winter markets and that they have summer markets. So, for instance, like the Caribbean, some of the winter sun destinations, they may be sitting there slightly more confident knowing that the likelihood is air, air is airlift is going to be working again by the time it gets around to their peaks um, and they're going to capitalize. You know, we've seen the Caribbean, for instance, show very high on popularity in search is of late. Uh, we know that the Canaries is popular, again another winter sun destination, um, where you look at some of the summer markets like Greece, like Cyprus, where a lot of people will travel in the summer, um, and Portugal and Spain, and they're, they're under a lot more pressure to try to, you know, reignite this tourism market because it's a fundamentally large contribution to their GDP. Yeah, yeah. Um, over to Martin again. So, one of your slides, I think, of the hurdle slide, the first the first hurdle um, you put down there was was FCO advice, which, um, as, as we mentioned, it, it, it's been not to travel for an indefinite period. And that they just tweaked the wording at the weekend, suggesting a, a movement in, in what we might consider the right direction. Um, and I guess if air bridges are, are agreed, then they have to change again to allow that. Um, so that's us positive, but like in everything, I think at the moment, there's always a double edged sword to this. So I was recently this week and they said, look, this, this, this obviously will allow trouble to happen. But the danger here for the future, for, for the summer is that um, because of the difficulty in providing all the services in destination, a lot of people who may be booked for the summer um, will cancel. And once flying is allowed again, um, they will look at sort of maybe the hotel hasn't got the kids clubs open or can't offer all inclusive. So they will use that as a, as a reason for cancelling because the flights are able to go. The difficulty with then getting the money back for the flights because the airline will say, well, you cancelled, but the flight's flying. Is there a double edged sword to that, Martin, where agents in particular need to be careful because they could find themselves back into a refunds issue in the summer? Yeah, I, I think I think there is. I mean, you, you know, you go back to all of this conversation. Um, when will things open up and when will they get back to normal? You know, by the middle of July, will you be theoretically able to get on a flight? Almost certainly yes. Will you be able to find a bed when you get there? Almost certainly yes. But will that whole experience look and feel like the holiday that you have, have known and loved all, all of these years? Yeah. Quite possibly not. And and I guess that's, that's the... The, 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 so there's, there's, a, there's firstly a danger that as people do start venturing out and, and, and tales come back, you know, the media look to with this sort of thing into a frenzy, don't they, about whether whether it's facilities aren't available, whether it's, um, 
you know, everybody's sort of wear, wearing masks in the restaurants and the, and, and the restaurants are, you know, it's, a, it's not a particularly enjoyable experience, whether it's because there's been an outbreak in a particular hotel and all those sorts of things, I think, are definitely a risk. And so they will be playing on people's minds. And um, yeah, the, the, the current package travel regulations around, um, there's a degree of, uh, of, of, there's a gray area there around um, what the, what the, What's the thing I bought delivered? In, did you deliver what I what I paid for? And and I think if people are looking at the whole experience as a whole and saying, well, yeah, absolutely, I I paid to go to this particular resort because it had a kids club and and a, and a swimming pool and a you know ten restaurants and actually half the restaurants were closed, the kids club didn't didn't work and I could only use the pool a third of the time because there was a there was a rotor or a queuing system. Um, that definitely opens the door to claims and so in the best case scenario it's it's a headache for operators in the worst case scenario you get back to where we were a few years ago which is um gastro type class actions you know you have people out in resort going you know you paid for a yeah. this luxury resort and you haven't got half the services you know you could make a claim for that and that's that's the real danger is it opens up the door to to, to that yeah. sort of thing again yeah and, and that is that um, i wonder if our, our operation agents are they are they covered in any way with their t's and c's on this or, or, or are the T's and C's fairly straightforward? A customer's got the right to cancel if, if it's a material change. Yeah, it, it always turns on on the terms and conditions. And so if yeah. you've got a very strong, as an operator, if you've got a very strong set of terms and conditions with a supplier, then yes, your customer still has a claim with you. Under package travel regulations, you were the package organiser, it's your problem. Mm -hmm. But if your terms and conditions with the hotelier are strong enough, then you've got a downstream claim against them because you know, ultimately it was their problem because they didn't provide the service so it's going to come down to that and that will be on a case-by-case -case basis you know we often i think inevitably there's a degree of the, the, the commercial reality if you're a very small operator working with a very large hotel group you probably don't have much room to go and if you're a very large uk operator working with an independent hotel you've probably got them on a much more buyer friendly set of set of terms and conditions and maybe you can um you, you, you can get some compensation out of them. It, it, it's going to it's going to be messy, you know. Like with lots of these these hurdles and lots of this kind of upstarting, you can see these sorts of things will, will come out, and it's going to be a challenge. You know, yeah. equally, it, this this pandemic has affected every type of business in travel, and so you could be used to sending people to a particular hotel which has got very very good service and great facilities, but because the hotel is running short of money, they've maybe have to lay off all of the very very good. Uh, service staff and they maybe haven't been spending money on upgrading the facility so your clients could get there and find the experience again just wasn't what they paid for i mean they, they are they're all risks yeah they're all risks just, just to finish on this sort of section on, on on that kind of you know getting excited about the bounce back or if there is one this summer um you know plenty, plenty of wise heads we've heard we heard speaking over the last few weeks have said you know everything's in furlough now and people have sort of gone into hibernation but the big danger point for many firms is that point at which you start trading again. Because the moment you do that, you start incurring costs. You start having to maybe if you're an agent, open shops, put people back into work. Um, and and the danger would be that if, if you do that, thinking there's going to be business this summer, from what you said with late bookers, smaller groups, younger travellers, destination mix change, it may not be very profitable business this summer. So you, you've got to be careful not to think, great, we're back in it. We're going to start incurring a lot of running costs for our business. And that, but actually, the business you bring in isn't that profitable. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And I think I think you, you then start to look at all, all all of the actions that people have taken in the last few months to keep their business alive have consequences. So if that that could be because you, you you've thrown down on a on a government loan, it could be because you've deferred some um, some of your VAT. You might you, you maybe have. Um, drawn down credit facilities all those sorts of things will sooner or later have have to start unwinding and um the, the danger is if you're only ever looking at the next few months of your cash flow you see that there's it's 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 2021 and 2022 perhaps when some of these things really start to appear in in, in people's cash flow and the whole kind of, you know the refund credit notes will unwind uh later in the year well that's you're still having to then deliver a service for money that you already received but maybe you spent that money on keeping the lights on or, 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 or you know keeping your your, your angry yeah. landlord at bay you yeah. still then got to deliver that service for the new holiday later down the line so all those things i think are are potential issues i mean we the, the work we're doing at the moment is just all about m monitoring and uh, forecasting and measuring cash flow and, and not because anyone has a crystal ball but just to know if this if, if if these scenarios play out 
this is when you're going to have an issue and here are where the levers here, here's where you need to start pulling levers and making decisions you know just yeah. to give, give you that sort of run, what is your runway and what is your what is the extent of your kind of foresight yeah J james that last question kind of relates actually to a question that nick dent has put on to the um q a so thanks nick um so he, he talks about the kind so you you mentioned a few deals there which have gone, gone gangbusters and they're doing very well for you but he, he asked about what kind of customers are looking for these deeply discounted offers you know, are, are, are they sort of long-term customers have they booked before um or you know his, his concern is that you can be very you know, sort of be busy fools so yes yeah you know, these deals out, the, out is the, it they're not totally making totally much out of it in the end no, of the day no i, I and, totally and, and, they're just bargain hunters so they're in they're in an app and, and yeah so so the, the you know a large majority of the travel zoo membership uh or an audience is um cash rich time poor you know they're they're plus plus 50 empty nesters um so one of the you know one of the assets that comes with with these individuals are they they like to travel and they they like to spend time out um but what they also do is they spend money and they will spend money not only on buying a deal but they'll spend money you know actually at the hotel and we've actually got a couple of very good examples um of recent deals where we've spoke to the the property in themselves to find out what the average spend was so to give you an idea you know penhelic arms which is a two night bed and breakfast offer for 99 pounds at 99 pound for two nights for two people but when we looked at what they were averagely spending as a couple they're spending 90 pound per stay so they're actually spending the same cost of the stay in uh um, FMB whilst actually at the the property, um, and there's another property called Langwood Hall, which saw an average 119 pound spend per stay. So it is it very is up to also the the properties that we deal with, and we do try to work with them, um, and we encourage them that they should obviously encourage spend in a, in a property. That's if they've got um, a, a, to keep the members to use the restaurant internally instead of going out down the road and finding one you know um but when i worked in tour operating before one of the uh, key trends that i saw with any deal that i ever ran on travel zoo and i don't think it's differed from now is that when i spoke to properties they said that the uk um the uk travel zoo customer was one that always liked to go to the bar and spend you know have a pre pre-dinner drink or a post you know post in a nightcap we are quite uh, comfortable in our skins when it comes to that in the uk wherever we go we, we do like a, a drink at the bar and um i would encourage all these properties that we work with um to to follow suit and try to encourage that spend from the members um it, we can drive volume but it's also up to the property themselves themselves um, to encourage spend and we can work with them on that yeah there, there was a there's a question on the Q&A about how you can I mean we talk we talk about the trade but actually your other customers are your deal providers your hotels you work with yeah. and, and it was how you can help those small hotels with their cash flow problems yeah you know, they're, gonna so, have, they're gonna have a real difficult time as, as, as especially with social, social distancing and, and having reduced yeah. volume so um so one of the advantages of working with us is we have two or three different ways of of facilitating deals um as a, as a partner so regardless if you're a small business or if you're a very large chain we can work with you in in different ways um some of those ways um alleviate the the cash flow problem because um you, we can work with you in the sense that we work with glh we recently worked with them they're a large brand we had a branded site and that drove them over a 48 hour period 160 uh, sorry, 1,617 room nights in 48 hours, but that was direct transactional sales to them. So they were generating cash flow immediately for sales for the future. Um, so there's one opportunity. The other is working with us on a voucher base, which gives the customer the flexibility of cancelling and changing any time. Um, but that means they only get paid when the when the the property uh, when they get to, to stay at the property um, and we also work on like the kind of the normal um, kind of direct booking pass that the likes of Expedia and Booking.com and everyone else works at so we've got lots of flexibility to work with our um, hotels and we encourage them to reach out to us to explore those um, because regardless if you're a four four kind of um, four catered chalet property and you, you want to sell some chalets or you've got 500 rooms like the Hard Rock uh, we can work with you. Yeah, and there's a very specific question on on the um, Q and A, James, um, asking if Travel Zoo 
offers are available to the travel trade to book? I think I know the answer to that, but uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, they are. Um, and um, firstly, we should probably give Travel Weekly a, a promotional code to, to, to plaster out so uh, we can give the trade some discount to some of these deals as well. So I think that would be the first. But if you are a um, small agent or you want to redistribute our product and earn commission on that, we can also work with you. We have a very good affiliate program. Um, actually, some of our tour operators who work with us, who advertise with us, um, redistribute our UK product because at the moment there's lots of people in the UK um, as tour operators who don't don't have a UK arm or don't sell domestically and we're able to work with them and provide them a platform a fully bookable online platform with UK breaks um, and obviously they can earn commission from that so it's if you are interested please reach out to me uh, my email address is on the screen and we can help you there good okay lovely well look it's, it's, it's three minutes to ten and I know we wants to finish around ten o'clock um, so we'll, so we'll sort of wrap things up maybe a quick last word from, from Martin who, who speaks to a lot of companies um you know we, we all want to see green shoots martin are, are, are you personally sort of increasingly more confident about about things and, and with good reason that, that that things may not be as bad as some of the worst predictions earlier on in the crisis yeah i, I think um certainly every day i'm having conversations with people who are themselves pleasantly surprised I uh, talked to an operator yesterday who said last week they did half a million pounds worth of bookings uh, yesterday they took one one particular booking for seventy thousand pounds so there are people out there you know, some of some of the stats that James just put up there on you know cruising I think is a, is a great example of that there are that there are people with money and with confidence but I you know in, inherently and as I've said before I'm a I'm a a, a northerner and a Sunderland fan and I'm sort of predisposed to negativity so I do tend to look at uh, slightly more kind of risk the, the, the risky side of things but I think you know I hope I'm proved wrong I hope there is a, a big run on holidays at the end of the, the end of the summer and uh, people are able to get bookings in but there certainly there yeah. certainly are the odd signs of optimism okay well lovely on, on that on that well then I'll hand back to um to James just to say a few words of, of wrap up so thanks for allowing me to do this again James and I think we're all off to book that Maldives offer now <laughs> yes and thank you Lee um from from all of us thank you we really appreciate you being involved with these sessions they wouldn't be the same uh, without you um, hosting the Q&A Martin thank you again from from us um Martin as uh, details are also on the screen should any of our partners anyone dialed in wish to contact Martin um he is available um with the details there um, and finally from travel zero i want to just thank everybody for attending today's session um, should you have any questions you can also reach out to me um, but we are very excited to share this data we'll continue sharing this um, information with our trade through this time and um, should anyone have any questions or even uh, wish to find out a little bit more about some of the data um, we've got the people in the business who will be happy to reach out and share that with you so for me thank you very much thank you lee thank you martin and uh, this call will also be uh, this video will also be recorded and published so if you have any caught up with half of it you can you can watch it from the beginning again thank you everyone